Glorious, glorious Wednesday morning, middle of the week. Isn't this crazy? Good to see everybody. Greetings, greetings. I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, where I just have to kind of watch myself here because uh, I don't know why they're asking me to let people in. They should just come on in. It's open and free. This is going to be fun. We're going to do some exciting things in the next couple of sessions anyway. Oil printing. So welcome, welcome, welcome. We appreciate everybody in here. Uh, let's see where I've got. Uh, um, there we go. Let's see. That looks good. I think. Let's see. Uh, let's. Uh, it's only ten oh one. We'll we'll see what people uh, end up coming in. So let's see if I can. Yeah, that's that's better. We can we can see that. Um, so welcome. This is recording. I may put this up on YouTube. We'll see. Um, sometimes I get a little lengthy and big, so uh, um, I try, though. I try to do that. Um, let's see. we got to make sure everybody's in here. Come on, on in. Come on in. Come on in. Waiting. Oh, I don't know why, why they're making me admit people today. That's, that's crazy. But we'll get there. So welcome, everybody. My name is Quinn Jacobson. I think you already know that, though, for most of you. And this is our uh, Studio Q live show. We're on a Wednesday, April 1st, right? Uh, nobody's laughing about anything today, I don't think. Um, everybody's in um, this whole crazy world we're living in now. Um, hopefully, we can bring some sanity through these little shows and get your mind off of uh, some of the other stuff going on. I I hope everybody's physical health as well as mental health really um, are, are doing well. I know it's tough. It is. It's it's no joke. And April Fool's Day is nothing to uh, laugh about now. So um, we'll get through this though, right? We're going to all get through it. We'll be okay. Um, we just have to uh, kind of follow those recommendations and make sure everybody is uh, on board with uh, not spreading that stuff around. It's crazy. Enough talk about that. We want to jump into our topic for today. And I don't care if we do uh, Q&A first or we do uh, the oil printing first. I, I don't care what. We're going to start with, uh, um, let me pull this up and make sure I can get to it here. Um, I've got this nice bright, uh, my, my light shining on me here. So I got, it's like I'm, I'm on a stage of some kind here. Let me pull this up and make sure that I can get to it and show you guys this because this is this will be important. Um, let's do a real quick technical. Or uh, let's see. Oh, I don't know why they have me up there. Close that. Let's just make sure everybody's in here. Yeah, good. Awesome. We've got enough folks in here. I know people join join in. Um, welcome to anybody that's new. Um, we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have a little bit of a. I decided to do these a little more structured so we can keep uh, keep some semblance of rationale or, or being rational about getting this information communicated to you, making it worthwhile for you guys to see what's going on. And so I thought, let's veer off of the silver chloride printing, and. Um, not really. I mean, you can ask anything you'd like, but let's veer, veer, let's veer toward a, uh, a more uh, creative pursuit. In, in, in other words, as, as I get older, you know, I'm 35 now. As I get older, I tend to want to uh, be a little more poetic in my, in my work, uh, be a little more, um, how do we say, not so, not so strict, right? Not so uh, rigid. And uh, what I love about the non-silver processes, the, the pigment processes, are that you have um, no silver nitrate involved, and you use the most basic elements, which you're going to see today as we're going to start on this, and to create the most beautiful, I mean, just some of the most beautiful prints you've ever seen in the world. I'm a frustrated painter, so I love, you know, the old Petzval lenses. I love to do portraits. Um, and, and that kind of softness and, and all that uh, that kind of involves those lenses, it's always given me a, a creative release that way. So I'm a frustrated painter. So processes like oil printing or bromoil, this is uh, 
This is a little different than brome oil. We'll talk about that. But oil, oil printing are, is just so amazingly gorgeous and beautiful, and you have so much control over it. And there's no silver nitrate involved. So it's not a photograph. We call it a print, an oil print. But we're going to talk about, we're going to start a series. We'll probably do four videos on this because we're going to take them slow, and I'm going to walk you through. I'm not going to get super excited about anything. I'm just going to kind of walk you through each phase. I have a little um, keynote that, that I'll pull up, and I'll also use my board because I want to express and, and communicate how the, this process works, not, not just how you do it, but how it works, because I think it's really important um, to learn how to do it um, uh, or to understand how it works so you, you know how to do it. So today, in part one, we're going to talk about what is an oil print, and then we're going to we're going to prep some paper. I'll show you how I prep my paper, and we'll actually pour a piece of paper uh, with gelatin, and I'll show you how to do that. And I'll talk about how to mix these and and do all this kind of wild and crazy stuff here. So, would we like to do the Q and A part first, or do you want to do the oil printing first? Um, holler at me. Let me know. Uh, let's see, how do I pop out? Let me pop that out. Um, I'll pop that out so we make sure we have everybody in here. That's great. I'm, I'm glad you guys showed up on a Wednesday. That's, that's really cool. Um, people are still wanting to come in. I don't know why I have to admit people now, but um, I'll, I'll do it. I'll just keep my eye on that. So if you're trying to get in, join us. This is going to be fun. Oil printing, I'm, I'm obviously going to use wet collodion negatives in this. But you can use digital negatives, you can use film negatives, you can use whatever you'd like. It works really well uh, to do that. Maybe what I'll do is we'll start with uh, a Q&A session. And we'll, we'll do a little Q&A at first. We'll go into the oil printing. Oh, did you see my fingernail polish? Isn't that lovely? Um, we'll do a little Q&A in the beginning. We'll do some, uh, some oil printing stuff and then we'll go back to Q&A. So, so if people come in here a little bit late. I know a couple of people told me they might be a little bit late today. Um, they're actually working, ironically enough. I don't know where they work or what they do, but thank you for everybody that's uh, out there in the hospitals and the grocery stores and the whatever we else need to get keep our lives going to some degree. I hope uh, I hope um, everybody makes it through and does okay. I think we will. I think we'll be fine. So let's do this. Let's talk about um, a, a couple of Q and A's. I had a couple of questions come in. Uh, the most recent one was yesterday. Let me pull that up so I know where I'm at um, with the question because I don't want to uh, misguide anyone here. And I'll probably end up posting this video because of these because they're going to say, hey, I didn't, I wasn't able to make it. Can you answer the questions and post it? So here's one from Christian Klant, Klant I guess. Klant, he's German, so I would imagine that's what it is. Um, he said, you know, thanks for the live shows, uh, specifically talking about negatives and printing. I'd like to contribute two questions from aspects that I experienced over the years, but haven't found a clear answer or solution yet. So this is really interesting. And of course, um, I did pitch my book here, but most of you have it. And, and it's good that you have it. And I appreciate the support. Thank you very much. Um, what we're going to talk about, this first question that Christian is asking about, actually relates to two things. And I'm going to try to pull them both up here. I should have them on that keynote but I, I you know that uh, I like to re actually show you this so let's let's go to page 53 is the first illustration you know we're all visual so that's how we're going to work here right page 53 and then let's jump up to where's my other illustration page 116 so I'm going to just bookmark these two so I can get to them quickly so the question is this um, I most often use quick clear recipe. That means he uses uh, ammonium iodide in his collodion to mix the two salts, at least two salts, right? Or one salt or two salts, three salts, four salts, whatever you want to use, some salts. For the iodide, he's using ammonium iodide. We've talked about that a lot in the past. The ammonium iodide is a quick release, breaks down fast. Uh, that's why it turns your collodion um, um, 
orange red quicker than you know the potassium iodide or ki um, that's not so soluble so the ammonium iodide is great for tonal range for contrast for making negatives those kinds of things but it's great in positives too right it's just some people don't like to use it because it breaks down so quickly and they only make a few plates a year and they want something to sit on the shelf so they might use a potassium iodide and or cadmium iodide or something extreme like cadmium never breaks down really so um, but his question is this during the last workshops I gave I got questions regarding kind of fogging that I wasn't able to identify clearly now he doesn't go into what you know people again we go back to this vernacular question right the words we use describing things in the process um, fogging uh, veiling scumming we those, those are different I generally classify, and 19th century books are a little different than this, I generally classify fogging as something that will not wipe off a plate, positive or negative, it doesn't matter, it just won't wipe off the plate. Veiling or scumming or undeveloped silver that, that, that develops out, you, you go too long, you've got an underexposed image and you go too long and you develop that unexposed silver, that will wipe off with a cotton ball, that's what I usually call veiling. <clears throat> and I think that's what he's referring to here, but I'm not really sure. But he goes on, he says, um, I got questions regarding a kind of fogging that I wasn't able to identify clearly. After some experiments, I was able to narrow down the reason for the fogging is very, very freshly mixed collodion. The same collodion is performing well in about after about a week. Why does this problem appear every, only every once in a while and out of the blue? Or, out, you know, I don't know if he used out of the blue, but... Um, uh, once in a while, uh, only appears every once and a while. <clears throat> Here's why, Christian. On page uh, 53, and I got to get the visual, I don't have the screen back up here. On page 53, you'll see this illustration. This illustration is really important for people working in the wet collodion process because what it tells you is it tells you the silver bath, not only the content of the silver in the silver bath, but also the pH. And it shows you, illustrates the color of the collodion. And that's why it's really important for me to use clear glass uh, um, uh, for my uh, bottles for my collodion. Number one, it keeps me honest, right? It, 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 it allows me to see what color my collodion is. So if we look, here's, here's my positive collodion sitting right on my table here. Look at the color of that. You get a fairly repre good representation of that color right there. And you can see that that color is probably represented right here, somewhere maybe in between these two. So on the top row, <clears throat> I talk about highly iodized collodion and slightly iodized collodion on the bottom. So the bottom is slightly iodized, the top is heavily iodized. What does that mean? That means that over time, with heat and light and time, the iodides have broken down into iodine. What color is iodine? It's red. That's the further you go down, the further it breaks down, turns almost. And I've shown you my bottle of old red collodion many times. I didn't cheers you. I got some coffee here. Cheers. It's 10:14 uh, in the morning here in the Denver metro area, so I'm still drinking coffee. So that highly iodized collodion tells you you need a certain type of bath to operate that with and that bath is a little higher in pH and a little lower in silver content. Uh, the slightly iodized, so when Christian asks why does the uh, freshly made collodion react, it's probably because he's using a bath like this up here and he's using a, a collodion like this down here. Does that make sense? So those, those, uh, those ratios or those differences will create two things. You can fog with this, actually. It's not just unexposed um, silver developing, that veiling type. You can fog with this. <clears throat> that means that the, the silver is too basic and or not enough silver content in it, and it's, it's stealing from uh, uh, the plate is, is getting robbed, basically, of iodides, and or... The other way, it's too acidic and too high a silver content. Um, so if you don't balance those two things, those two things out, this is what happens. Silver baths last for a very long time. We know that, right? So we use our silver bath over and over again. We may aerate it. We may do a little bit of maintenance on it, filter it, and those kinds of things. 
but we're going to go through bottles of collodion or a, a load of collodion before we ever switch out our silver bath. So there we are working along, no problems, no problems, dropping plates, perfect, good, good, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden we make a fresh batch of collodion. We still have that old silver bath and we pour a plate and it just white, it's just fogged. It's just, it just goes berserk. It doesn't work any longer. What's happening there, and if you turn back to page, uh, let's go all the way back here um, to page one. What was it? One, I got a bookmark here and I can't get to my bookmark. Page 116. What's happening there is that double replacement process where those two salts in the silver nitrate are switched over, changed over to light sensitive halogens. And that process has to take place in a certain environment, both temperature, salt content, silver content, pH. Um, you can read all about it in there, the details. But if that's off, you're going to have problems. So what happens, you make that fresh batch of collodion, you're using that old silver bath, and you get all kinds of problems. You say, oh my God, look at the plate before, look at the plate after. It's just flat and white. It could look like fogging. There's there's a whole bunch of different things that can happen to it. Um, visually, it just depends on your environment. And there's supposed to be someone coming in in a little while that has a similar problem like this, and we can look at it. That's why I asked him to come in if he could. But here's what you do. You can resolve that problem by either making a fresh silver bath with the content of the silver up and the pH proper for your new collodion. Um, I think that's him right there, sorry. Um, you can make a new silver bath for your new collodion, which we really don't want to do, right? Every time we make a batch of collodion, we don't want to have to make a new silver bath. It's, number one, would be broke, and number two, we'd have 20 bottles of silver around us, which I have about six silver baths and a couple of big ones. But um, <clears throat> So what's the best solution to this? Well, there's two, there's two things you can do. The first thing you can do is take some old red collodion, like I've show you, shown you before, that old red stuff in the bottle, and add a little bit of that old red collodion to the new collodion and start help, start help to, start to break that down. Help to start break that down. That's easy for me to say. Um, and that old red collodion will exacerbate or speed up the process of releasing that iodide, those iod breaking down those iodides in the nitrocellulose. What will that do? That will give more iodine or iodides in the solution, decomposing in the solution. So when you put it on your plate and put it in your silver bath, you won't have that reaction anymore. That's the first thing you can do. You can, you can quickly break it down with old red collodion or a little bit of potassium iodide. Um, I mentioned this before, how, how you can do that. That's how they used to, to uh, ripen their collodion back in the day. So this wouldn't happen. That's what they're talking about. This wouldn't happen. Or secondly, you can take your, your freshly made collodion, put it in your windowsill, or heat up a, a pan of water and burp that bottle. Heat and light break that down quickly. Or there's actually a third way. You can just set it, set it out in the light for a few days, couple, three days, and might may only take a day, it just depends. And that will break down and help that process of stabilizing that silver bath and the collodion. So when you make a fresh set of chemistry, you make your collodion, I don't care what kind of collodion you use it, the recipe stuff is kind of a, other than shelf life and maybe some contrast and depending if you're making negatives or not, but the, the whole recipe thing is kind of a moot point to me. I've talked about that before, but if you're making a fresh set of chemistry, you're making your collodion, your developer, and your silver bath. You're mixing it all up at once. You pour it, and you've 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 iodized, you've excited your bath, right? We leave a plate in um, your bath. This is basically what we're doing on the opposite end with the collodion to fix this problem. But we excite the bath. We mean we fill it up with iodide so it doesn't rob it from the plate. If you do that and you pour your plate, your collodion and your your silver bath is going to match up just fine. You're going to go through that whole. 250 or 500 mils of collodion or whatever you've made through that silver bath, maintaining it a little bit here and there, filtering it, letting air it out, air it out and that kind of thing. And then the next batch of collodion you make a month or three or six months later, whatever it is, that new collodion 
is going to react with that old silver bath and you're going to have the problem or you could have the problem. It's not always that way. It just depends on, you know, there's so many variables here, but typically that's what's going to happen. So that I hope answers that question. Then he had another question about um, pulling the, the plate out of the silver bath, putting it in the camera, exposing the plate, coming back. And before he developed, he had what it, he calls, it looks like it was a wax surface and you had beaded up silver around on the plate. And I told him the only thing that I know that it, that, that could, could cause that, and I've only seen this maybe once, maybe twice in, in the whole time I've been doing this, is you've got too much water in your collodion, meaning that you've added too much distilled water breaking down the chemicals or, or you've used it an alcohol that's too heavy in water or um, somehow excess water has gotten in your collodion. Another telltale sign of that is our chambered lines or crepe, crepe paper on the actual image. You'll see those little chambered fractions if you get real close. That means there's too much water in your collodion as well too. So those are a couple of questions um, uh, from Christian. And then I had Sean, uh, oh, oh, sorry, somebody's asking a question here. Thanks for chatting in. Uh, when, when using a negative film, do you use a plastic film between them to avoid silver contamination of the film? By, oh, sorry, let's see, let me, when using a negative film, okay, yeah, do you, do you need to use a plastic film? Oh, I see what he's saying, yeah. You can, yes, uh, it, absolutely. I mean, we've got wet surfaces, so yes, you can use a sheet of uh, a plastic, basically, um, and just make sure that it's, you know, non-UV and all those kinds of things. But what he's talking about, he doesn't want to contact print a film piece of film onto a plate, right? So he's trying to con make, it, make it positive or negative onto a plate. Um, I tend to use multiple collodion types that contain different iodides and such. Would that potentially cause problems with the silver bath? As in, should I stick to the one collodion? Uh, no, John, you're you're fine with that. Here, here's the catch. Um, the the catch is is the new collodion, the new collodion, the stuff that hasn't broken down. And this is what I sometimes refer to um, when people say, "Oh, I don't want. I want to use um, a KI, a, a potassium iodide." And th this is all iodide based, not bromide based. That, Forget about bromides for a minute. This is iodide based because that's primarily what you're turning the, the, the emulsion or the film into is a, is a silver iodide, mostly silver bromide as well too, but mostly silver iodide. So people say, I want to use a potassium iodide because I don't make that many plates and I don't want it to go red on me and then I have to pour it out and it's no good or it doesn't work. I can't work with artificial lights, whatever the case is. So what happens, they make a potassium iodide collodion, whatever recipe variety there is, there are out there, and they go, they, they pour their plates and they lack tonal range. They lack uh, contrast, if you will, because that potassium, the K, is not soluble in those solutions for a while. It takes a long time to break down. Whereas ammonium, NH4I, ammonium iodide, breaks down, decomposes rapidly. That's why we get the color shift so fast. That's my favorite color to make positive images with right there. That's beautiful, beautiful range, beautiful color, uh, or tonal range, beautiful contrast. Um, <clears throat> you, can, you could probably even make ne decent negatives with that as well too. But the problem with the KI, it's great for shelf life if you're only making a few plates a year or every couple of months or whatever, and you don't wanna waste your money and your collodion turns red, you mix up an NH4I batch and it sits there you use it for a couple of days and you come back in six or eight weeks or two, two or three months and it's, it's all red and you can't use it anymore unless you want to make negatives outdoors. So people get a little bit frustrated with that. So I, that's why I've broken down in my book, I've broken down a couple of, you can make a small batch, large batch, and it, you can use KI. It's great. It's fine. It's a wonderful collodion. There's nothing wrong with it. And if you give it enough time, you're gonna have that tonal range and beautiful contrast and all that other stuff. It's just really difficult. I sometimes, <clears throat> I'll cheat a little bit and my positive collodion 
if I have a little bit left over, if I don't use it all up, if we made a big batch for workshops or whatever and we, we haven't used it, I'll let it age through and I'll use it for negatives. You know, I, so it kind of turns into a negative recipe for me. So I'm able to use that stuff up. A lot of people can't and I get that. So I'm just telling you the, the, the problem lies in the freshly iodized collodion and the older silver bath. That's the problem. You're using multiple salts and multiple, that's fine. It, it, it really might even help you to be honest with you in some way. So don't worry about that stuff. It's, it's perfectly fine to use it that way. Um, so I had another question here um, and I don't know, did, uh, did Sean make it in? Sean, are you in here? I can't see you up there, but um, Sean uh, wrote me this morning and yesterday, I believe both. And he's having uh, some real problems. Uh, looks like light leaks to me. Um, I uh, maybe, maybe see if I can share this. Let me see if I can pull this up real quick and share it with you guys, because it's really good to see these things. Um, if you if you can see the problem, if you can see, look at the plate and see what's going on. It will it helps you tremendously. Um, I'm admitting people, but they're not showing up, and I wonder why. Um, let's see here. Let me pull up behind the scenes here. Um, do, do, do. I'll show you. I, I don't think he'll mind. He was going to come in here and share anyway. Um, I'm going to pull up my message here. There is Sean. Sean Robinson is his name. I believe he's in the UK, uh, if I'm not mistaken. I told him to run a test plate, a chemical free plate here. Yeah, here, this is great. I want to share this with you. This is the stuff that you're going to see quite, quite often. Um, see if I can share that. Share that right there. You see that? That is classic. Um, light leak, uh, chemical, uh, the, the problem we were just talking about, this imbalance in iodides and really hot stuff going into an old silver bath. I'm saying this is probably more likely a light leak. Uh, and so what I have people do is this. I have them take a piece of glass, and you can read it, no, uh, no exposure test in my book. You can read about it in there. I have them pour the collodion on, put it in your bath, do the sensitization, pull it out, wipe it off. Don't expose it. Go right from your silver bath over to your cup of developer. 15 seconds, develop it. Of course, nothing's gonna be on it, right? But 15 seconds. Do your same process, <clears throat> wash it, arrest the development, and fix it. In a perfect world, on a piece of glass, you should have a perfectly clear piece of glass. No exposure and your chemistry is good. That's the first thing you want to do. Um, the next thing you want to do, if your glass is clear, then you know you have a light leak issue somewhere. Now you got to figure that out. If you have this happen in your dark room, you're probably, now it's going to be more difficult. The first thing I recommend is get rid of your lights, red light source in your dark room and switch that up. Because if that's fogging your plate in your dark room, there's no way to tell if it's chemical or if it's light. If it's not happening in your dark room or dark box or whatever you're processing plates, then move that into your plate holder. Take it out, mess around with it, put it in your cam on your camera. You don't have to pull the slide, just, just do that and run that plate. See if your plate holder is leaking light. If you don't have anything happen there, it's a clear piece of glass, then next you want to go actually mount it up, pull your dark slide. Do not pull your cap or open your lens. Just do a few second exposure, pull it off and go back and process it and see if you have bellow light leaks. Those are the things that you want to uh, pay attention to when you're uh, um, looking for, there's another play to his, when you're looking for uh, problems. I get these all the time. These are always coming into my my inbox and, and people asking me what's wrong. It's difficult to tell from a distance because I don't know your setup. I don't know who mixed your chemicals. I don't know if your chemicals are right. I don't know what kind of lights you're using, all those kinds of things. So I, I just kind of started process or have this methodology of walking through these kind of test plates, check for light leaks, check, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, check your chemistry, check your chemistry first. Um, I would say about 60% of the time it's chemistry and about 40% of the time it's light leaks, either in the dark room, dark box, wrong type of light, wrong type of headlamp, 
or your, your camera, or your bellows, or your plate holders leaking light. Um, probably the latter is, is the least of the problem, but it, it happens, you know? There's so many variables. That I, I, I love to try to help people learn um, how to work through their problems, but there's so many variables. Hi, hey, hey, Nicholas. Hello, hello. Came late. Great to see you, buddy. Where are you? I don't see. Oh, let me see. Let me put the gallery view on. There we go. There's everybody. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm going, let's see. I had one, I think I had one more question here. I'm trying to keep uh, keep the chat up. Uh, let me see if I can pop the chat. Pop out chat. There we go. And keep the the attendees here going. Um, there's the chat, okay. And I can close that Facebook thing down, I think. Sorry, <clears throat> technical snafus here. So, okay. So having said that, I'll, I'll try to keep my eye, my eye on the chat. But having said that, we have enough in here to make a go of oil printing. I, you know, yeah, I, great. Yes, sir. Great. Well, Jan here. Yes, Jan. How are you doing, buddy? I start with the uh, wet plates collodion process for uh, in September last year, five, six months. And my experience uh, last two months is that if I mix, I only make small bottles of collodion. Yep. 250 milliliter. And, and I take it down to one third again, then I mix it up with new, fresh, and then I have old, old collodion in it, and mix it together. And every time, no, it's perfect, perfect. perfect. And if I make a, a big one, new one, and I take two thirds with the fresh collodion, and I also take a little with the negative collodion. So it's like uh, calling uh, on uh, Petterlin, Mr. Petterlin, calling it Tutti Frutti mix together. <laughs> Tutti Frutti. There you, well, there you go, Jan. That's exactly what I just said. Exactly perfect. Great way to work. You're just, what you're doing is you're taking high, a little bit of highly iodized collodion and mixing it with fresh so it balances yeah. out for your silver bath. Exactly right. I get, I get so great uh, to knowledge, you know, I'm so sharp in which I blowing in a way <laughs> yes yeah exactly exactly and that has uh obviously that has so much to do with your light and lens but your collodion has to be spot on you know you you have to get that 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 right tonal range really what we're talking about when we talk about this Jan, is is we're talking about a a collodion that will give you that range so it's so disappointing what and i don't mean this in the in the pejorative or the bad way but it's so disappointing to see people uh, post images, positive images that really lack so the range they can get out of this process. They're overexposed, their chemicals are too hot, they haven't ripened their collodion, they haven't broken down those iodides, they're so worried about it turning red that they like this straw yellow stuff. Um, and I mean, sometimes that can work depending on how you function, right? But most of the time it's not going to give you that tonal range. And most of the time, they're going to overexpose a little bit. So that blows everything out even more. So you end up with this um, kind of average image that, that, that loses uh, uh, the, the sharpness, appearance of sharpness, because it's overexposed, and definitely no tonal range. Tonal range gives you that separation. And that's what this process is so good at doing. And when your collodion isn't right, and your exposure isn't right, and your development isn't right, you won't get that. So very good point, Jan. That's what you can do. You can just mix, save a little bit in the bottom, save a little bit. And I always say, like in my book, I say you never want to let these bottles dry out anyway. So either add a little alcohol and ether in them with the, the bottom bits of collodion down there, um, and then add your fresh stuff to it. Or use this. I've shown you this many times. You're, you're probably tired of seeing this. Or I have a little bit of that around. Now that's red collodion. That's all red collodion. And just a little bit of this goes a long, long way to, to, to spike up uh, the freshly made collodion. But that's what happens. It's a common problem. Everybody thinks it's a big mystery. It's not a mystery. 
it's chem it's chemistry a little bit of physics and and once you understand that and once you recognize that problem oh i just i just made new collodion that's that's why this isn't working so i have to spice it up so either use some old red collodion put it in your windowsill for a couple of days um i think christian's email said that he you know a week later or something there's no problem and that's that's right because it breaks down that those iodides and it gets along with the silver bath. And we're not gonna mess with the silver bath all that much if we don't have to. We wanna maintain the silver level where we want it and we wanna maintain the pH of that bath. Those are the two critical things in that, right? Having it clean, having the right amount of silver and maintaining the pH level. Those are, those are real critical. And we talked about pH before, the uptake of that double replacement, how those ions switch out, AGI, AGBR, the byproducts of the nitrates, all those kinds of things. So um, keep that in mind. It's very important. Uh, just like uh, dangers in the dark room, um, not all photographers are chemists, but they should be, right? <laughs> that's, that's kind of important. I mean, at least a little bit. I'm not a chemist either. I mean, I, I make no claims to, to any of that. I, over the couple of decades here, I've had to learn what I've had to learn and I've experimented and I found out what works and what doesn't and what makes sense and what doesn't. And, and it, it's so far it's worked out. Okay. Oh God. I'm sorry about that guys. Admit, admit. I'm sorry about that. Dale and you go. Good to see you guys. We're just in here chatting about a uh, little bit of chemistry and about problems with using fresh collodion and old silver bath in my fingernail, man. Isn't that beautiful? I didn't pay too much for that either. Just a, just a couple minutes. Soak is all I, <laughs> I've been doing prints, so. Linda, hello, I bought all new chemicals and it really didn't work so far. Oh, well, tell us about it. Come on, tell us what, what, what's your problem. Get in here, unmute yourself. Well, this is my image. Oh, let's see, let, good, this is why we're here. Okay, there it is. It's all silver. There it is, okay. So it's almost came back to a negative again. Exactly. So tell us what you mixed. What kind of salt did you use? What kind of iodide? Well, the thing is, I bought all new chemicals, so they were pre-mixed. So pre-mixed. Um, what kind? What yeah. kind of collodion? I have no idea. Okay. Positive new guy something. Okay. Okay. Good. That's fine. So now yeah. tell us about your exposure. How long was your exposure on that? Well, and, I tried different exposures, and that's. I had an image before, but it came back to this one. So okay. I left it for a while, and this is what I got. Take your finger and, and rub, take your finger and rub on that plate like that. Take take your index. Yeah. Now look at your finger. Is there anything on it? Yeah. Okay. A little so bit of silver. Okay. Yeah. Those. That's just a hot, overexposed plate, and or mm -hmm. you're overdeveloping yeah. as well a little bit too. Right. I think I did overdevelop because I couldn't see anything. I couldn't get anything yep. from the picture at all. So I think it's, but this is also like, you see? Okay, how many happened. seconds of exposure? I think I had two. And maybe. what f-stop is your lens open to? Well, I'm pretty new at this game, so I'm just figuring everything out. So okay, that's no okay. Food. That's fine. Like, what, can we look? Can do you have your bottle of collodion there handy? Yeah, I have. Just, uh, but I made some new. Oh, oh, okay, okay. So tell us what you changed. Tell us what you changed. I made all new collodions and uh, developer and everything. I made. There you new. go. I have a I have a guy that's helping me, and he was my mentor at this workshop. So Good. I came back to him, and he helped me. So I got all new stuff, and uh, I don't know what to do with the old things now. <laughs> well, from the looks of your plates, uh, maybe you just yeah. want to maybe you just want to set that aside because it looks like to me. Uh, yeah. What kind of new collodion did you make? What kind of new collodion? I I don't know exactly what kind of collodion he made. I think he followed. I think he followed one of your recipes. Okay, so it, it looks like because of the contrast range yeah. in that, it looks like he's using the ammonium iodide, and and you're yeah. getting so much. But this is a typical thing with fresh collodion, yeah. fresh everything, overexposure. They look just like what Linda just showed us on those first couple of plates. Yeah. 
And then now here's here's I and I don't mean to I don't don't throw that chemistry away that that other chemistry. No, no, no. What oh. you want to do is wait a week, maybe two. Or, or, if mm -hmm. I remember correct, you're in Denmark, correct? In Sweden. Sweden. Okay. So yes. it's cool. It's still cool there. So maybe two mm -hmm. or three yep. weeks. Wait for mm -hmm. that collodion to age. Then pull that okay. collodion out. Pull that kid out and try that same. Yep process again you may be very mm -hmm. surprised okay. I will. yeah Thank because you. at the end of the day we're talking about breaking those iodides down and that looks right. like to me it's just not there quite yet right it's too fresh everything too fresh too fresh yep. you said something a, a picture when it looks like crepe paper Did yes you see here yeah it looks like this yeah, that's so, that's yeah. just um, overexposure and over de or overdevelopment there. That's just yeah. going too yep. long. You probably didn't see yep. anything coming up on the image, so you waited no, and didn't. waited and you waited, and that's yep. what then you developed all the silver on the plate. Right. Yeah. So and it's good though. You're one, learning. This is so what you need to go through. That looks great. Fifteen seconds. Yeah. That looks great. So that's perfect. Yep. I see the it. chemistry and the it's physics awesome. will work. You just have to kind of push it through and experiment. I said last time we can't. I can't teach anybody this process. People have to. Take, I can give some guidelines, but people have to go in their dark room, go in their studio, yeah. their dark box, wherever they're working, and just start working out. And then, and then yeah. come into groups like this and say, "Hey, what's wrong? What did I do?" And people, somebody will chime in and say, "Oh, that looks like this. That looks like that." Exactly. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm choking. That's, on my that's just what we did. I don't have any leaks in my camera. Everything is perfectly fine. So. Yeah, your, your plates right there look great, Linda. I'm glad to see that. Yep. That's that's terrific. Good job. Awesome yep. job on thank that. You so yes. much. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, thank you for jumping in. For, that's a really important Absolutely. Uh, and um, thank you. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You're very welcome. Thank you for your support. I greatly appreciate everybody that's that's purchased a book and helped me out. Um, I love obviously, it. the world's changed right now. So we're, uh, we're in freeze yep. mode right now. And... Uh, I hope financially everybody does okay. I don't, uh, yeah. I'm a little bit worried. I'm a little bit worried. Yeah. Let's just, let's just hope for the best. Um, we'll do it together. <laughs> yes, I agree. I, and we are a global community now where it doesn't mm -hmm. matter if you're in Europe or Asia or America's, Americas, it doesn't matter. It's, we're all global now. And obviously this, this disaster shows us that. So yeah. Jan says, I don't think so much about Czech silver bath after I start and mixed collodion. Um, tell us, what do you mean, Jan? What do you mean by that? Yes. After I start mixing collodion, I have a, a major fresh collodion after I mix it. Yeah. Uh, before, before I had problems uh, like this uh, fogging and whaling and whatever <laughs> the name is. But after I, let's, the silver bath is clean. It's no uh, dirt in it. I filter it uh, every 14 days. Yeah. I don't check anything anymore. But before I had fresh collodion, and I think it's wrong, wrong with silver bath. But and as I learned my process, I start to have uh, mix it all collodion in the fresh one. Then I start see picture be better and I take more old collodion on from my brain bottles and uh, waste bottles from collodion you yeah. said yeah and then I see oh I'm that's one that's the color yeah and then I don't have to look at my silver bot anymore I only yeah. think about uh, filter it sometime but I don't check pH I don't check uh, yes it's uh, only one time a month I do it yeah, and, and that's good. You, you, you don't have to be obsessive. Your, your pH and your silver content isn't going to change radically. What's going to change is you're going to have the, uh, you, remember in that double replacement process, you've got nitrates, ammonium nitrates and cadmium nitrates filling your bath up constantly. You've also got solvents in there, alcohol and ether. So eventually, and you'll get away with this for a long time, Eventually, you're going to start getting streaks and model marks from the solvents, solvent streaks. You're going to start getting, um, um, eventually, if you work it really hard, you're going to start getting pinholes, these, these iodized 
precipitating out on the plate itself and creating little pinholes everywhere. You're going to get, you don't have to check your pH and your silver content every time you uh, do your. I see, I, when I uh, see pinholes, black pinholes, then I take it uh, up in the room I have uh, upstairs and I uh, have uh, the sun it for five, six odd, uh, hours in the very special uh, LED uh, spots. It's UV light spots with. Uh, Perfect. 450 nanometer. It's yeah, the right frequency. Yeah. So four or five hours, it's black everything down in the bottom. Yeah, exactly. And I filter it two, three times, and everything up we go again. Yeah, good. good, good. And what's he, mm. what, he, what he's doing there is he's removing, not all, because you'd have to titrate to see, but he's removing those excess um, um, compounds. And he's also... Um, I'm, I'm a big proponent now. The aeration, the solvents uh, create so many problems for people. You do not have to obsess over your silver bath. You just have to take care of it. Um, there's nothing wrong with your silver bath because you make new collodion and your plates are white or fogged or veiled or whatever. That's not your silver bath. That's your, that's your fresh collodion. The iodide is not broken down. Again, that's why I'm a big proponent of NH4I, ammonium iodide in collodions versus potassium iodides and clothings. They both break down, but the, the, the latter just takes longer. So, excellent, that's wonderful, good stuff, good stuff. Is there anything else? I'd like to get into some of this oil print. We'll, we'll, we're gonna do our uh, paper and our uh, uh, gelatin today, and I'm gonna show you how, how I do that. Um, and you'll love this. Oil prints, like I said, are not photographs, they're prints. They're pigment prints, meaning we use gelatin and, and ink. We don't use silver chloride. We don't use uh, anything light sensitive other than dichromates, and we'll talk about that. And um, I just want to walk you through this. So uh, let's jump into that. Let me, let me do this. I'm going to open this up. Uh, I'm going to share this with you so you can see what I'm doing here. There it is. I'm not going to bore you to death with this. Don't freak out because I'm PowerPointing on you. I'm not PowerPoint on you. I'm just, uh, I just want to go through this with you so you can see what I'm doing. So the, uh, work, this particular process is called the Rollins oil process or Rollins oil pigment. And what we're going to do is we're going to quickly walk you through how this process works, why it works, and um, some of the problems you might uh, run into. Um, so. Uh, the oil pigment pr printing process, sometimes referred to the, the Rollins oil printing, or is different than the brome oil. Everybody always talks about, oh, brome oil. Oh, you're doing brome oils. No, brome oils are enlarged from uh, you, you could, like traditional silver chloride printing uh, or gelatin, silver gelatin printing, um, and they don't. They, they're not contact printed. These are uh, oil pigment prints are contact printed. So meaning the size of your negative is gonna produce the size of the print you make. That's really important. And G.E.H. Rollins, he's the one that introduced the wedge step and, and, and they really kind of took off at the turn of the century. Um, how do oil pigment prints work? Uh, I find this fascinating myself because um, what happens, I'm gonna just illustrate this here for you, but this is our paper. And on our paper, what we do is we, put a selection, and this is, you're gonna see me do this today. We're going to, you see that? We're going to, uh, we're going to pour a piece of paper. On our paper, we um, place a layer of 8% gelatin. And we'll talk about what gelatin or gelatine is, whatever, however you wanna say it. Um, <laughs> John, hey buddy. Almost like the crazy cousin of brome oil and car. Yes, absolutely. That's a that's a great way to put it. It is a crazy. It's a beautiful crazy cousin of them. Um, we put a eight percent layer of gelatin, and it, it's it's liquid. It's melted, so we pour it on. We pour it on the the paper. We use little magnetic strips. You're going to see all of this, and then we let it dry. So that's as far as we're going to go in this session. I'm going to get you through what it is, paper preparation, and then we're going to pour the gelatin. The next session we come in, we're going to sensitize it and print it, okay? So, and then the following sessions, we'll, we'll, we'll ink it out and do all that stuff.
but I want to take this slow and methodical. I tried to do too much in the last one and I, I'm not going to do that again. I got called away by my family, but um, so we take our paper, we pour a layer of 8% gelatin on it. We let that dry. And then we come back to that same layer after it's dry. It usually takes about a day. Um, we come back to that and here's our paper. And let's just say we're doing a, an image this size. And what we do is we brush uh, potassium dichromate, pot dichromate, and acetone, a mixture. And we're going to talk about that. We brush that over the gelatin like this. Dry it bone dry. This is the, this is the potassium dichromate are, because, is light sensitive when it's dried. It's chromium, but it's light sensitive. It's not... Uh, it's not uh, silver nitrate sensitive in, in that capacity, but it's still light sensitive. So we've got a layer of gelatin and a layer and, and brushed with potassium dichromate and the acetone, this is called spirit sensitization. It means that it's, uh, it, it evaporates quickly and dries fairly quickly rather than using water. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I'll, oh sorry, yeah, I'll pull that up here. Let me do that. Let me pull, he, Let's, uh, how do we stop share? Let me share this, stop this. Um, boom, boom, boom. Exit that, go back here. There we go. So let's go back here. So we have a layer of paper. You're gonna see this today, a layer of paper and then a layer of 8% um, gelatin. And we're going to talk about what kind of gelatin you can use. And I actually did a little bit of research on this. And uh, there's, a, there's a product called agar agar if you're a vegan or you don't want to use these animal products. I'll tell you what all this stuff is. 8%, that's, uh, that's plenty enough. I, sometimes I'll do 10% uh, tissues on carbon printing. 8% for this oil paper works great. So that's dried. Then we use potassium dichromates. And we do a, what's called the spirit sensitization with the foam brush. We go over that and, we, and now it's sensitized. Once it's dried, it is sensitive. I found between about 10 and 12 minutes is for my particular negatives are a good exposure for this. So what happens when you expose this gelatin that's been coated with dichromates? What happens? This is, this is what I really want you guys to understand is how this pro, uh, process works. It works on a oil water basis, meaning that when you have a sheet of paper, and, and this is the image here, and these are the, this is if you cross section, let's say that's, that's the image with the gelatin on it. When you swell the gelatin in water, gelatin's gonna lay flat like this, just like this when it's not swelled. It's just gonna lay flat, even flatter than that, but for this illustration. When you swell it with water, H2O, the highlights, uh, let me back up, sorry, let me back up. We're not quite there yet. <laughs> you expose the print to that 10 or 12 minutes of, of light, <clears throat> 10 or 12 minutes of UV, good UVA, be light, so to speak. Uh, I'll use my Ryonet, or if it's a sunny day when we do this, I'll put it out in the window. You expose that. And your negative, let's say these are the shadow areas, and this the rest are highlights. So these are shadows, and these are highlights. The, the clear part are highlights. That dichromate with UV light hardens. So the shadow areas hardens, and the highlights do not. So the highlights, the stuff, this is reverse. So the stuff that's covered does not harden. That gelatin does not harden. Keep that in mind. The shadow areas in the midtones, to some degree, right, harden or begin to harden. The gelatin begins to harden. That's what the dichromates do to it. So now let's go back to that other illustration. We take that paper, we take that paper, and here's our layer of gelatin that's not swollen. And here's our, here's our paper. It looks like a little heartbeat, right? Here's not swollen gelatin. And I mean swollen with water. And this is swollen with water. What happens 
is the gelatin that's hardened, the shadow areas in the midtones are stay flat. They do not absorb water. The dichromate has hardened those. The light hitting the dichromate has hardened those. The areas, the highlights that did not harden swell with water. So those highlights swell up and the shadow areas stay flat. That should make sense, right? So now, after we've swollen that print, I'm going to show you, you can see the relief on it. You'll see the highlights are bulged up and the shadow areas are flat. So what, what does that mean when we take a roller here or a brush covered in ink, a graphic arts ink, and we roll over that print? We roll over that print. What happens are the highlights full of water resist that ink and the shadows take that ink up. Does that make sense? So the shadows turn black or brown or whatever color ink you're using, and the highlights stay paper white or some variation thereof, right? The, the midtone ranges on down. So you've got your shadow areas taking the ink on because they're flat and hard, and the highlights resisting that oil or that ink. The ink is graphic arts ink, so it's basically oil. It's oil, lithograph. So it resists. So that's how we come up. Then it dries flat again, right? After the print's dried. So then our, our, our shadow areas are dark and our highlights are white. Shadows dark and our, our take on ink and our, our highlights stay, remain white. That's, that's the beauty of this process is it's so fundamentally easy to understand and, and uh, the inking is quite difficult to do. That's the most difficult part of the process. But once you get that inking down, we start with a roller. You're going to see this in a couple of days after we go through all this. You start with a roller, and then you take a wedge step brush, and you modify that. So, um, But I want you to understand the principles of this, of the gelatin, the dichromated gelatin hardening where the light hits in the clear areas or the void areas of your negative, and doesn't harden in the highlighted, the, the, where it's silver, can't penetrate, the light can't penetrate, so the dichromated gelatin underneath stays soft, or some degree of soft. So, and then you swell it and you ink it. Does that make sense how that works? I hope it does. It's, it's fascinating. When you see it, when you see it, you're going to absolutely fall in love with it, if you haven't seen it. I'm sure a lot of you have. Um, Let's talk about what you need in the process um, for uh, making these images. So I got ahead of myself here. Um, hard, there, that's what I'm talking about. The second paragraph, I'm, I'm just talking about the principle that oil and water don't mix. Uh, gelatin hardens where the light hits the paper, midtones and shadows, blah, blah, blah. So the selected hardened gelatin is known as the matrix. And that word we're going to come back to in a little bit. Um, so what is uh, gelatin? Gelatin, as you can see here, is, uh, let me move this, gelatin or gelatin, I don't care how you want it, however you want to say it, some people, tomato, tomato, we don't care. It's um, material from animals, basically, that's hydro, uh, hydrolyzed or broken down with water, and it's collagen. So it can, it can take on water and dry out, take on water and swell and dry out. And that's, that, that structure is what we need to pay attention to because if you get that too hot, um, it won't gel. It'll lose its gelling potential. So I'm going to talk about that in just a second here. Um, so at the end of the day, what we have here is we have a print covered with this animal tissue and or the second paragraph, I talk about that product, and you can search this out if you're a vegan or you don't want to use animal products, I understand that. Agar, agar, do a Google search on it and you'll find what that is. Um, I've had people use that. I couldn't remember it the other day in a video, but I've had people use that uh, for salt prints as well, too. And then the third paragraph, be sure not to overheat this gelatin because that swelling and drying and swelling, gelling will it'll lose its structure. So over 60 degrees Celsius, about 140 or so degree Fahrenheit, um, you're going to start losing it. And the more you heat and swell, uh, the more you liquefy 
and then dry, liquefy and dry, you're gonna you're gonna have uh, problems with it. So just keep that in mind. Um, so what what's needed? Here's the chemistry, real quick. Um, I like to use the gelatin, um, the Photo Bloom 250. 250 is a number that tells you the structure, how strong that gelatin is. And because we're pounding on these prints and rolling them out and stuff, that structure, that gelled, swollen structure, tends to stay better with 250 or above. I like 250. Distilled water, grain alcohol, of course. Potassium dichromate. This is a very dangerous compound. You want to wear gloves while you're handling this. You don't want to mess around with this. This is like cadmium bromide. Um, you just don't want it on you or in you at all. Um, an acetone. Can you use ammonium dichromate? Yes, you can. But I like the acetone mixture. The spirit sensitization, as you're going to see in a couple of days, works so much better. Well, the clearing agent. After you have that print, um, after you have that print uh, exposed, you've got your negative. You make your 10, 12 minute, whatever your exposure is. Pull your print out. That it's going. That print is going. You're going to see the image on there. Um, I print until we'll talk about exposure here in a sec. I print until I see some of the highlight uh, details and the highlights. But it's going to be orange, orange brown from those dichromates hardening up. Now you have to clear that that dichromate out of the out of the paper and the gelatin both. So you need a clearing water and clearing agent. The clearing agent I like to use is EDTA. Try to pronounce that name. I I won't even try. Um, that's a huge long uh, name. Ethylene diminute tetraacetic acid is basically what it is. And I use sodium bisulfate or sodium sulfite. I usually mix the EDTA and the sodium bisulfate, 10 grams each to one liter of water, and it clears in about 30, 40, 45, 50 minutes, maybe an hour. We're going to go the full hour. EDTA is great at pulling out chromium. That's what dichromates are. Potassium dichromate is a chromium-based salt, uh, light-sensitive salt. So that's why we use a clearing agent. And once that image is cleared, your matrix will be, you'll be able to see, you know, it's, it's beautiful. The, the gelatin swelling, you'll see that relief. The equipment, um, don't, don't run away from this. These are just suggestions and you can use how, when you see me go through the process, um, this, this will be really simple for you guys to do. If you have film negatives, digital negatives, wet collodion negatives, whatever, you'll, you'll fall in love with this process, I guarantee it. So don't, don't run away because there's another list to go through. But um, I like to use glass bottle mason jars. You're going to see mine here in a minute. Various bowls. Um, I take a cut. If I'm, if I'm not using a bottle, I'll cut the bottle in half and use that kind of thing, like distilled water bottles and milk jugs and things like that. I'll use those as bowls. I use a small glass bowl to sensitize. You'll see it in there when we do the dichromate sensitization. Foam brushes I get from a big box store. They're just the two inch, you know, simple foam brushes. A plastic comb, you're gonna see that today over here when we pour the uh, paper. Pipettes, the little tiny pipettes, these, I love these things. Um, I know, I'll show them to you when I blow the screen up. And a steel uh, table or a cover, you're gonna see how I work mine, I have a steel table. Sometimes I'll use a hot plate, if I'm doing a lot of paper, if I'm pouring, gelatinizing a lot of paper and I don't want to keep running back and forth, um, I'll just use a kind of a double boiler thing. You'll see, I can show you that. Magnetic strips, you'll see over there, a razor blade, contact printing frame, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, just typical pot paper uh, printing out stuff. The ink, I like to get this from the Graphic Chemical Ink Company. Uh, there's another brand over here I'll show you. Um, I like, really, I like the 1903 brown. That's the stuff I really like. We'll do, we'll, maybe we'll do one of each and you'll see. Sometimes I like to mix it a little bit. A brayer roller to, to get your ink out on your piece of glass. A little three inch foam roller to do your, to do your initial application of ink. And then a step wedge brush to touch up. Uh, that's the, th those are the two inks that I use from the graphic chemical company right there. Um, and you can you can try any of them. I mean, they got you know red and yellow. You can try any of them. And here's another great thing, guys. I want I want to mention this real quick here. Um, here's another great thing you can do with this process. It just blow your mind. Um, here's the little pipettes I was talking about. Those are that I like those. They're 
they're a three mil pipettes. And they're, they're great. But here's another great thing about uh, um, oil printing. You can actually ink up a print. And if you have a press or something, you can roll that through. You can ink up a print and the ink doesn't dry for a week. Uh, my, my, my crayon brown um, takes about a month to dry. Once the paper is dried and the gelatin's back down, the ink is still wet, you can take that print and lay it on another piece of paper and put it through a roller and do a, a transfer of it. So now you have two prints. It, it, the stuff is insane what you can do with this. I mean, it, it's a whole nother world uh, you can get into with this stuff. And I love it. I mean, it's, I would say my two main processes, honestly, are the, the ones that I love the most are uh, collodion chloride and oil printing. Those are, those are my two. It's not albumin. It's not salt. Those are beautiful. They're great. Everything's wonderful that way. But those two really, uh, those are my two favorite processes for sure. So that's the ink. Um, making the gelatin. So this is really simple. Um, I'm going to go in the dark room. And I'm going to grab my jar of gelatin right now. But what I did, uh, and I just made this fresh yesterday. I filled up uh, this mason jar. You'll see it here in a second with 500 mils of distilled water. And I added 40 grams of my Photo Bloom 250, shook it up, it gelled up 20, 30 minutes later. I, it's swollen, right? It, it swells, it takes on the water, the collagen takes on the water and swells up. Then I put it in my little bucket of 250 um, water. Let's go, in the, let's go in the dark room and I'll show you that right now. I'll, I'll switch back, I'll switch back here. Stop share, I'll switch back to our, my, our normal view. And here we are. Come with me into the dark room like you haven't been here before, right? You've all been here before, most of you anyway. So here we go. Spin around, it is dark, so let me turn on some light. Red light first, that makes sure we don't have anything out, and then white light. So here we go. Here's my trusty sink. So in here, these are the these are the things that I when I say dishes and cups and bowls, I, I do this every distilled. Thing. I, I'm always using that. Here's my little rock holder to hit, hold my prints down, all that kind of stuff. So there it is. There's my 8% gelatin. It should say on there. It does. 8% oil print. And this is just an old fixed jar that I melt my gelatin in and fill it up. Got my temperature. Fill it up to the temperature. I'm going to run it through one time just so you can see here how I do this put my gauge in here. I'm going to check. I'm going to go up to 50 degrees Celsius, about 122 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is just, I've got my hot water heater set at 130, 135. So here's my temperature climbing. You'll let that, there's a 40 degrees, 45 degrees. I'm going to blow that out. 45, and here we come up on 50. It's pretty close. Since I'm already melted, there, there's 50. Since I'm already melted, I'm just going to uh, throw this back in for just a second here. And then what I do is I, I'll take the thermometer out and keep that jug down. I'll just do that. So it can sit there and uh, melt away. Here's my little double boiler. I put 55 degree water in here. I put the amount of oil I want there and I take it out to my pouring table. I'll show you all this stuff. So how did I make this gelatin? I told you I took 40 grams, I took 500 mils of distilled water, filled it up 500 mils of distilled water, and then I added 40 grams of Photo Bloom 250, shook it up, and then melted it just like you're seeing now. So this is melted pretty good. It's not quite all the way melted though, not quite. And after it melted, I poured in about 15 mils of grain alcohol in here. Why, what does a grain alcohol do? It takes away all the bubbles, all the air from shaking it and mixing it up. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and mix this up really, I'm gonna, we're gonna let that sit while we do, go do our paper. There's our 120, there's 50 right on, 50 degrees Celsius right on the money. Pop that in there, put that over. Let's go out and do our paper. So there's our gelatin. Super, super, super simple to make. I have some paper here. 
When I talk about dichromated paper, this is what it looks like after you dichromate it. That's that orange, bright orange color. That's, that's sensitized, ready to go. I, ha I have a whole bunch in my safe box here. Half plate, six by six. I like to play with it, it's fun. Like I said, it's my favorite process, so. Let's Quinn, go to the paper. Quinn, can I jump in here? Please, please. Uh, when you're saying paper, what, uh, what particular brand? There you go, perfect segue, Dale, I appreciate that. That's a perfect segue, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn you on to it right now. And that's a very important point because the wrong paper is always a problem in all these processes. This is really hard to get a wrong paper with this, but at the end of the day, um, there are papers that are better than other papers. So you just saw in there, this is my swell and gelatin liquefied, um, and I, I put the alcohol in it. Um, we'll come back to the uh, sensitization, but let's do, uh, let's jump to the paper. So, I like to use two, two varieties, and I have one of each here, or a couple of each actually. I have a couple of varieties. I have the Hannah Mule, and I have the Arches Platine. Both, both the, the deckled edge stuff is really nice. I like either one of those papers. You can do this on any good acid-free, or 100% cotton acid-free rag paper. Those two, I can, guarantee you will work very well for this. Um, just like everything else, you just wanna make sure you mark the emulsion side. So I'm gonna do this right now. So those are the papers. Can I'm I, gonna, yeah. Just to follow up there, Please. so if I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, you're, you, the, the objective is to use uh, a heavier weight uh, paper in a 240 GSM or so, uh, because you're gonna beat the crap out of it? Is that I, the objective? I, that's, that's a very good point. Um, well, I have not made this on uh, Strathmore paper or uh, crowbar paper. I haven't done it. Um, it would probably, uh, it would hold up because, you know, 100% cotton papers are pretty tough. But you're right, two, 200 gram plus. I think, I, if I'm not mistaken, the Platino is 310. Uh, the Arches, um, it's 300. So yes, Dale's, Dale's absolutely correct. The heavier papers tend to do a little better. Um, I'll, I'll throw a caveat in there. What you're gonna see me do today, I'm gonna soak this paper for a few minutes. The heavier papers, the heavier paper you go, the longer you, you're gonna wanna soak the paper before you pour the gelatin on because that gelatin gets in the paper and if your paper is dry at all, you're gonna have a hump and you're gonna have no gelatin on the hump and this big big puddle of gelatin below, and that's gonna cause a problem with your exposure and your, your swelling and your inking and everything else. So Thank you. Um, either one of these are great papers though. I can, I can guarantee you the Arches Platino or the Hannah Mule, either one, great paper. We're gonna do both. So how do, what do I do? How do I prep my paper? Well, I know, and all you need here is a, uh, a pencil, I should have a pencil there, right? <laughs> Look at me. I'm so prepared, guys. I'm so prepared. Here I go. All you need is a piece of paper and something clean that will give you the size of the, the print you want to make. This is a this is a six by six or 15 centimeter, just a, a just some test plate that I use to mark when I'm doing my uh, my um, oil prints. I cut this paper eight inches by eight inches or 20 centimeter square for a 15 centimeter um, print. So like that, right? So what this is what I do. I'm gonna take you down here. Let's make sure you can see this. I think you can. Can you guys see that or am I tripping? Yeah, something like that. Maybe move back here a little bit. So my paper obviously marked the emulsion side is up here. I, I'll even write on here. This is the Arches Platino. This is the Arches Platino paper. So what I like to do, why do you mark these papers? Why do you do this? Well, you're gonna see over here on the table where I actually pour the oil on it. You need those marks so you know where your magnetic strips go and then your oil's on there, or your, your gelatin's on there, and then you, you di when you dichromate it, it just gives you some reference. So I'm gonna get that nice and squared up. 
and I'm just going to mark all four corners, just like your regular photographic kind of good stuff that way. And there you go. Got it marked and ready to go. So, and on the Hannah mule, we'll do a Hannah mule here as well, too. Um, I usually take a couple of inches off the bottom. These are eight by 10 sheets, emulsion side up. And turn that over. I'm just going to mark that. I just took it out of the package. And I'm going to do the same exact thing here. I'm just going to take it, make it look nice. Big, big, that's, I just leave a kind of squared up. Man, keep hitting that. Too much coffee, huh? Hit that. Boom, 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 boom. And I'll write HM on the bottom of this. So I know that this is the Hannah Mule. I'll write it up here. So there's there's our Hannah Mule paper, all squared up and ready to go. So I already did um, one sheet. Sorry about the jiggly jiggly there. I already did one sheet of Platino. So I have two sheets of Platino, and I have one sheet of Hannah Mule ready to go. So having said that, our gelatin is in there liquefying and. 122 degree water, 50 degrees Celsius water. It will be completely liquefied. What we need to do first though, is we need to soak this paper. And again, this is really important. And please don't forget this step or, or you, you won't have very much success with this. If you don't soak it, those fibers are dry in the paper. You pour that gelatin on there. They're gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna start bubbling and swelling and turning on you. And then you're gonna get high, low, high and low points on the paper and you don't want that uh, for obvious reasons. You want a straight gelatin um, coverage. And it's gonna be about um, a mill millimeter to two, mil two millimeters thick, basically is what I go for. So on this size of oil print, I pour about 30 mil, 25, 30 mils. I'll, gi I'll give you some instruction on that when we get there. So let's go in and throw these in the wash and get our gelatin prepared uh, to come out and pour. My pour table is over here, and that's, that's not P-O-O-R, that's P-O-U-R. Um, and I got another light over here so you guys can see what's going on. I'm fortunate I have a great big area down here I get to work in and nobody bothers me and it's, it's awesome. I have all my lights on there. Yeah, I do. Do I have all of them on? No. I knew there was one missing. Let's see if I can get this set up so you can see. Yeah, that'll look good. So this is where I put the um, paper and the magnetic strips are here. Yeah, that'll work great, I think. And I can also, maybe I can set you up over this way too. I'll figure that out here. Let me go grab a box that I can set you guys on. Actually. We can use this, what I'm using over here on this side, I think. Yeah, that'll work. Because we're not inking today, so. Ha, ah, look at that. Yes, I like. Yeah, yeah, that looks good. All right. Let me get my roller. We're not inking. We're not going to do a print today. I've been doing print, so I'm just going to move this stuff out of the way. Slide this over. Yeah, I like that. Can we do it like that? I think so. Yeah, good. All right, let's go. Let's go put our paper in the water for a couple minutes and get our gelatin ready here. I don't think I have to. Plug in over there. I will if I have to. But so let me grab a big tray, and and we'll do. I don't say tepid, cool, warm water to do these in are fine. Um, yeah, that'll work fine. I'll move my gelatin out of the way, and I'll, then I'll do, set these prints in some water, and we'll get we'll get our gelatin ready. I'll just do a quick rinse on this tray here. Mm. 
Feel good. Just get that in there. Put the honey meal on top, I guess. Cool or warm water, it doesn't matter. All of it's good. I'm actually going to take a couple of my rocks. I told you guys before I use these rocks out of my garden. I'm just going to hold this paper down. Paper tends to flow out, and you want to make sure before you do that. Um, I got them wet in between, but just make sure there's some, some space there, right? So you don't have a big air pocket. The worst thing to do is have this paper not accept the oil. So just like that, I'm going to put my timer on just to remind me. And we'll set this aside here. I'll just set this over here. Let it do its thing. Keep everything under water. And now let's come back to our gelatin. So again, here's our gelatin. That's melted nicely now. That's all melted, completely liquefied. And I'm going to keep it, I don't need to keep it, uh, I'm only gonna do a, a three prints today, so I don't need to really keep it. Uh, it'll stay liquefied for quite a while. It's quite cool down here though, so maybe I will throw it in. There's 120. Perfect, just like that. There's 120 again. I'll just throw it in there while we show you what I do here. Remember, I, I talk about a double boiler. This is my idea of a double boiler. I have a hot plate if I want to use it, if I'm going to do a whole bunch of plates, of course. But I'm going to fill this. Um, I'm going to get everything really warm, all the glass really warm with this water. See the steam coming off of those? So I'm at 100 uh, Fahrenheit-wise. I'm at 135. I'm at 58 Celsius, almost 60 Celsius. So that's good and hot right there. So that warms my little bucket up. I'll just leave some hot water in there. And I'm going to guess that for three prints, I want to do uh, 30, 60, 90. I'll go ahead and do 100 mils or 120 mils. So what I do is I just put water in there. Then I figure that'll that'll ride just beautifully, just like that. So that's I might take just a tad bit of water out of there. So as that's cooling off, just like that. So now that's my double boiler. I'm going to fill that with oil or, or gelatin rather, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna go 100 mils on that. So here we go. I'm going to dry this off. <clears throat> I don't want any tap water inside of there. I'm gonna pull my oil out, just so I don't dribble water in it. I like to wipe stuff down like that. Open it up if I can. <clears throat> my hands are a little wet. Open it up. And let's give ourselves a hundred mils. That'll give us a little over 30 each to do each piece of paper with, which is fine. I'll put that back in the hot water just to let it go. Now I'm going to get this so it stays melted in my little um, carrier there. And sometimes if you have bubbles on top, uh, which I don't, but if you do, I have a little spray bottle to show you here. Have a little spray bottle of grain alcohol that I just, you can just spritz with like that. It should be over here. So we have 30 seconds on our paper. I'm actually going to pull one sheet out at a time because I don't need to, uh, I don't need to really pull them all out. That's enough. How about, uh, we'll pull the bottom one out. Pull the bottom one out like that. And what I like to do, oh wow, I got some ink on that. Oh well, it's not in the image area, so I'm not gonna worry about it. 
what I'm going to do here. So I'm just going to quickly squeegee this off. My gelatin is still staying nice and warm in there. You don't have to worry about that. I just have a little squeegee over here. However you want to do this, it's fine. I have a little ink on the back of that. That's where I got ink on the front of that other one, I guess. Yeah, you got to watch that ink stuff. So I just squeegee that off as well. Let's go pour a piece of oil paper. Can I carry all this stuff? I think I can. Yeah, I can. So here we go, guys. Maybe. Balancing act here. Get everything in the roller door. And then over into the light. This is fun. You guys will like this. It's very uh, zen like if you're not trying to photograph it. <clears throat> so there, everything is. <clears throat> so let's talk about what you need over here. Um, I'm just going to make sure that my area is clean here. I have a piece of aluminum laid down. This is a steel top table. These are the magnetic strips that I talk about. Um, oh, there's people wanting to come in here. Sorry. Um, these are the, the magnetic strips I talk about. Even through that aluminum, they'll go down to the steel. So I have a top, sides, blah, 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 all that good stuff. So, just want to make sure this is all nice and clean. I'm going to lay my, this is the Arches Platino paper down. And what I'm going to do here, you have to kind of uh, cross section these. Uh, there, that's where my marks come in nicely, right? Or not cross section, you just have to make sure that uh, you line these up right. And those marks give you the good, uh, good places to go with it. Well, there we go. So that's my six by six or 15 centimeter area on the, for the oil, the gelatin. I keep calling it oil. It's gelatin. It's gelatin, Quinn. There it is. Just, you can give yourself a little latitude. These don't have to be perfect, perfect, but you don't want to, you don't want to cut in too much in the image area because you want your full negative printed. So there it is. That looks good. So now, what we're going to do is take the gelatin out, our melted gelatin. We have our little piece of comb ready, right? This comb is going to allow me, that's, you saw that in the list, you're going to see me push it around. I'm going to connect all the sides up here. So here we go. I'm going to pour about 30 mils out. So I'm going to go down to about 70 milliliters here. And I'm going to try to pour it in the center as much as I can. Somewhere right in, right in there somewhere. Put that back in there. And then quickly with your comb, just start moving it to the edge. Don't get too, don't get too rambunctious. Make sure it's all connected. When I say connected to the strips, this is what I mean. There you go. And I leveled this off so we know the table's level, level, or it was. Maybe I moved it a little bit, but if you have a little piece of something on there, don't, don't concern yourself too much with it. I'm going to move it back here because this is where my level spot was. So I might be just a tad bit off here. That's okay. We got it. So now it's just going to sit and it's going to stiffen the gel, gel up again, right? So this is where you kind of walk away and you do another piece of paper, you, you know, whatever you're doing. We have those soaking in there. Our gelatin's still nice and melted and warm here. It's not a problem. Um, It'll just take a couple of minutes for it to do its thing. And what I like to do, this stuff is really sticky. I, I keep a little um, 
paper towel, wet paper towel if you can, or you can just slide it in the side of your hot water there and pull it out. Same with your magnetic strips. Um, and just wipe it off. You don't want this stuff getting plugged up with uh, gelatin. So there we go. And just be patient with this. Don't, don't get in a big hurry. Um, your razor blade, as we're sitting here, I'm going to use this side of it, not the cutting edge. You don't want to cut your paper. You just want to get in there and open, remove that gelatin from the magnetic strips. And you'll see how it goes here in just a second. That's looking good. Nice uniform yellowish color over the image or through the image there. I can talk to you a little. Can I get down here? Yeah, a little bit. Um, so really simple. It doesn't take a whole lot to, uh, uh, somebody's trying to get in. Um, doesn't take a whole lot to do this. And, and it really actually, it, it, it works so well. Um, that's even better. There you go. It works so well. Uh, time consuming, yes. But if you follow the procedure and you don't get in too big of a rush, um, you'll do just fine. I'm going to check to see. It's almost there. So I just went along the edge of that, not with the cutting edge, but with this top piece, this edge here. Not with the cutting. I don't want to cut my paper. I reverse this razor around. So I go down this edge here, and I can see it's gelled up. And you come across here. Take your time doing this. There's no hurries, no worries here. And once you have those strips cut away, I like to flip them up like this and pull them off. And again, like I said, have, have something that you can wipe this stuff off on. Um, let me move this over here. Um, I'm just going to use this piece of paper towel here. I'm just going to lay them on here. Um, here we go with this one. I'm just going to pull this up. You'll see it. You can see it pulling away. That's why you want to cut those, cut that gelatin from those edges, right? That's really important that you do it that way. Again, same thing here. Hold your paper down. There. And finally, the bottom piece. I try to break them. I'll turn them up like that and then skirt them away like that. So now what we have is gelatin that's setting up. You can see about how thick it is there, right? I mean, you can kind of see anyway. Let's take it back in to the dark room. Maybe you can see it better over here. Yeah, you see how thick that is. There we Quinn, go. Yeah. What is what is in this sizing uh, that's different than the sizing you might use for a salt print, for example? Um, nothing. Um, in fact, the salt print you you have a salt in it, right? And so you have ammonium or sodium chloride in it. This is yes. just a this is just a very heavy, thick layer of gelatin. And when you see it, I'm going to put you over here. I'll hang this up. When you see it uh, dry, um, how I hang with it like this, I put boom. They tend to curl a little bit. And these smaller ones aren't a problem. You get in the larger prints, they can become a problem. But there's nothing different. It's just a very, move my hooks out of the way. It's a very thick, very heavy layer. So the, the percentage is still 8% gelatin. So the difference being you're putting 30 mils on and allowing it to dry on site as opposed to the salt where you allowed to drain off. Exactly. And this, you, what you're doing is you're trying to give, so this would be considered the binder in this, right? And that's, that's yes. kind of how we talk yeah. about it, right? Um, I'm going to let those soak for a minute more. We'll do another one here. Actually, let's okay. pull that mule out. Um, Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Chime in guys. Anytime I can, I, I can hear you just fine. So if you have questions, holler at me. I'm going to leave that last piece of, I got a little bit of ink on the top of that one. I don't know if I want to do that one. <laughs> we'll do this one though. Let me, let me squeegee this hand, piece of Hannah Mule off. I want to do one Hannah Mule and one, uh, one Platino. 
Yeah, so it's just a it's just a heavy layer, heavy layer of gelatin on there. Just for the sake of argument or discussion. Yeah. Uh, could you add a citric acid to adjust the color or no, that wouldn't make sense. Disregard. That was a dumb question. <laughs> yeah, I got it. I know. It's, it's hard to shift. It's, it, I know what you're saying. It's hard to shift. Um, sodium citrate um, will we'll adjust color in salt prints, but it's hard to shift from going from silver chloride prints to these pigment prints. I mean, these, yeah. these are colors all done. Like here's some here. I got some red litho. This is the other company I was talking about. I got yellow, red and brown and then i've got my traditional they're all wrapped up you'll see these on this next yeah. episode uh, that was i was halfway through the question when i realized duh <laughs> <laughs> I'll, no i worries. will, I will no mute again <laughs> that, that's that's exactly how it is it's uh it's a different ball game which it's a good ball game it's just a different ball game so here we go here's the hannah meal um right side so here i go i'm just putting my magnetic strips down left side i should uh my bad on this uh, not cleaning these off sorry about that and not you don't want to drip water around either but you got to get that excess gelatin off of there here's the left side i'll just take another paper towel Boy, everything's getting in such short supply. My paper towels and I had a stock of rubber gloves and distilled water is hard to find now. It's getting weird. But we'll still that makes, it. makes a question on toilet paper. Yeah, <laughs> toilet paper, God. Crazy stuff. <laughs> Crazy. Here we go. We just do it. See how I've staggered these? So you you because you, you can't make a square or the, whatever size image you're doing, it doesn't matter if it's a square or not. You just have to stagger these a little bit to get them to all fit. Some are longer than others, so you need to close that gap up. And I just have them marked like this, so it just makes it easy for me. There's another six by six right there. Take our, our gelatin just been sitting over here, my quote double boiler, if you will. It's not really a double boiler, I call it that, but water-wise it is. We have 70 mils here, so we're gonna go down to 40. Um, what, what do you need here? You need your comb ready. That's my, my big comb. Where's my little comb? Where's my little comb at? Yeah, I'll use my big comb. So here we go. Quit wasting time, Quinn, get on it, man. I'm tired of listening to you ramble about this. So a little bit more. There's our 40 mils. And again, take your comb and just push this out to the edges. And the next time we meet, we're going to print these images. We're going to dichromate them and print them. Do this fairly quickly because this gelatin will start setting up and you don't want to have big marks on your, in your image. I don't know where my little, little comb went, but it's around here somewhere. <clears throat> oh, there it is. I'm still obsessing about it. I have, I just broke a comb in half. Doesn't matter, you can use either side. I don't know why I'm tripping about that. But make sure your uh, table's nice and level too, right? Um, this, this table, steel for your strips, level for your gelatin, and um, you're, you're in good shape. Your magnetic strips. I do half plate, whole plate, six by six. Those are the sizes I do. Maybe I'll pour us some whole plate between now and our next video. And uh, we'll, we'll, do, uh, we'll do some whole plate, a little hot there. We'll do some whole plate uh, oil prints. So this, this stuff is just absolutely phenomenally gorgeous. Uh, oh, <laughs> uh, while that's setting up, let's do this, guys. I didn't even show you this yet. Can I do that? So as you take material out of a beaker and you try to float it, you, you don't quite get it. So we're going to let that sit. We'll come back and cut it. But I didn't even get to show you some examples. Come on, Quinn. What's wrong with you? Turn my light back on. <clears throat> Let's show you some examples of some, some of the stuff that I've done. Uh, one thing I think you're going to find fascinating. Um, I hope you do anyway. I was gifted. Let me turn you around here. I was gifted in my studio in Denver 
uh, people would come in. I wouldn't say often, but pe people would come in every once in a while and they'd want to meet me or they want to see what I'm doing. And, and I appreciate that. I'm, it's, it's great to have people interested that way. So I had a, a, a studio in downtown Denver, about 20, 30, 40 minutes from here. And Denver grew and uh, totally uh, drove me out of there. I couldn't, I couldn't afford to be there any longer. So uh, people that stop in every once in a while and, and, and want to see what I'm doing. And, and a guy from Kansas City came in one day. I can't remember the guy's name. And he said, hey, I just wanted to meet you and I, I got a gift for you. And I, you know, I said, what? Oh, you know, I met him. No, what, what do you mean you have a gift for me? He says, oh, well, I was renovating or I can't remember the exact story. He had, he had some property in downtown Kansas City. And he, it was an old photo studio in the late 19th and early 20th century. And he said, I want to give you a couple of negatives that I found. I said, really? You know, and I said, oh, okay, let's check them out. So he gave me two negatives. And I'll show you the one here. First off, he wanted to know what they were. Um, Obviously, they're dry plate, right? They're 16 by 20 or 40 by 50 centimeters. They're dry plate. And they've also been touched up. You see, see grandma's face there? Lead pencil, take all the wrinkles out. Um, so there they are. I got two of them, grandma and grandpa, one of each. They're amazing, they're amazing negatives. They really are. Uh, super dense. Uh, grandma's face right here, I think, if I, if I remember correctly, was about, uh, I want to say somewhere in the density range of 195, 198, just barely under two on D-max on, on a densitometer. I'm going to set grandma down here. So I thought, wow, wouldn't it be fun to print it? So I printed grandpa on collodion chloride, and then I printed grandma as an oil print. As an oil print, using just straight black lithographic ink. And if you could see this in person, it's it's a lot warmer than what I'm seeing it on screen here. I don't know. Maybe if I shine that light, that 5600 light, it's a little bit warmer there. But there's grandma as an oil print. This is uh, 30 centimeters square, somewhere in there, 12, 12 by 12. So the takeaway is we need an incredibly dense negative. Um, you know what? That's what that's what I wanted to get to. I found. I found in my, I've been doing oil prints for about three years now, I think, maybe four years, somewhere in there. Um, I found that uh, my best images, um, and let, can I go grab one more image and I'll give you the exact density reading on these. <clears throat> Sorry, I wasn't prepared, I didn't have these out, but I'll get them out now. And I want to show you that the, the kind of stuff you can do. I started experimenting until I got so busy. I started experimenting with uh, playing with these. Uh, this particular negative, and you've seen this quite a bit. It's from my ghost dance. But this is my oil print on brown, um, which I just, if you guys could see this in real person, you, you'd absolutely love it. Um, this is printed in the, in the lithographic brown. On uh, this particular negative, the density in the keep out, I call it keep out, uh, massacre site, the density in the keep out is 1.9, 1.9. And that's my D-max. And my D-min goes all the way down to, uh, down in the, this area, is some of that area is 0 0.3, 0 0.4 D-min. Um, so, Dale, your question is a great one. I find 16517 to one, uh, just under two and uh, printed 10, 12 minutes for my particular negatives make great uh, oil prints. They make great oil prints. I started exploring just a little bit with, well, this is gelatin. You can melt this stuff. Can I melt it after I inked it? And look at what I've done with this one. I just love this stuff. I love it. I love playing around and experimenting 
you know, this is one of my ghost dance images, right? You've seen the negative. Uh, in fact, <laughs> there's my, my one little test thing and I'm using is a, um, so man, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, is there, there's a lot of latitude here. And that's only using, I, you've only seen two of the inks. My, my favorite is the brown because it's more of a, of a mimics more of the traditional. I like, I like the warmer colors and I like the ambro types, the, 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 the warm colors. I like all that. If you want to do it straight traditional, use the lithographic black. Uh, that, that high contrast, that looks like a silver gelatin print. It's, it's just wonderful. I usually so in, use a little both. Yeah, go ahead. In, in practical terms, the, the uh, uh, suggestion might be that uh, if, to, to build the negative density up, what one is doing, which is important, I gather. Yep. Um, it's important to to build that up to about the same level as one would for a solder and aluminum in negative. Um, there you go. That's a great print, analogy. Yes, if they'll you print, they'll print both ways. So there's no learning curve then in that respect. Anyone's printing the, the it, salt print negative. Yeah, and if you're good at this, is a caveat I'll put there. If you have a negative that prints well on solder albumin, you're probably going to do real well with the yeah. oil print. Here's okay, the caveat: you. if you're good at inking. If you're good at inking, and you're going to see this in our next video, if you're good at inking, which I'm not that great at inking, I mean, I, I can do okay. I mean, I, you know, that's that's my claim to fame there. Um, if you're good at inking, uh, you can this this process can go down to one three in the D max. I mean, if you're good at inking, let's let's talk about what does that mean for for you guys that don't understand what Dale is referencing. It's just vernacular we're using for the maximum density in a negative where the silver is the thickest, where it let, le, lets the least amount of light through, that's your maximum density there. So we're giving numbers on a densitometer. I got a densitometer over here. I just press down on a negative and I see where the, the, the D max is. And then you can go to the D minimum. Where's your minimum? Where it's void, it might be you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.04, whatever it might be, clear glass, whatever. Um, so your D max, what we're talking about is, is we gauge off a D max, if you've got a well-exposed, well-developed negative, you're going to have the ranges all the way down to the void areas or near void areas. So we're talking about the maximum density, meaning that the pop in traditional salt and albumin and colloidal chloride and all those are self-masking. So the shadow areas are going to take care of themselves. We're concerned with the highlight areas. So you'll see on our next video, we actually expose these oil prints until we can see some uh, detail in the highlights and then we clear them we swell them and we we ink them so um, d max for salt prints and, and and albumin prints you know be around 1718 one nine even um, you'll get away with a good oil print if you don't know how to ink up well uh, do the inking up very well um, if you're good at inking up you can go down way down and do a bright ambro type and make a beautiful oil print um, and why is that? Because when you think about what we talk about oil and water resisting, the gelatin, the dichromated gelatin hardens in the shadow areas and say stops, stays soft in the highlight areas, meaning the highlights take on water. And when you roll it out, um, those resist the ink and stay white. The paper dries down and the paper is white. If your D-Max isn't really strong, like albumin or salt strong, 1.8, 1.9, 1.7, somewhere in there, um, you're going to have you're going to have less of a chance to repel that, and you're going to ink up. There's a lot of inking up problems. We're going to talk about that on the video. The, the most difficult part of doing this is inking that print, and it takes practice. But boy, when you can get it down, the world's your oyster. It's like Photoshop on steroids. You can change contrast. You can take marks out. You can take pieces of the image out you can I mean right I mean you can do anything you want plus you can let it dry down let the ink dry swell it again and put another color on it right I mean uh, transfer it uh, you know I really don't know why it, it, search for Rollins oil prints search for getting information on this particular technique you're gonna be amazed not a lot out there I mean very 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 little and I don't know why this has not, like, especially in the wet clothing community, really taken a hold. Like, you know, salt and albumin and all those traditional stuff, that, you know, like everyone kind of does those. 
and th those are silver chloride prints, right? They're not, they're not pigment prints like carbon and oil like we're talking about here. This is not a photograph. This is a print and it has no silver nitrate in it. It has complete archivability. There's no, ink's not going away. Once that stuff is dried, uh, this isn't going anywhere. This is just is not going anywhere. And I don't think grandma could have ever envisioned herself as, a, as an oil print from that great big negative that you can imagine, right? Let's go cut this print, uh, the magnetic strips off of this uh, gelatinized paper over here. Looks good. Uh, I didn't bring my bucket over to do this. So I'm going to sit you right down on the table. There we go. <clears throat> Remember the opposite side, not the cutting side. We're not trying to cut the paper. We're just trying to remove the gelatin from the edge there. Remove the gelatin from the edge there. Boom, boom, boom. Just like that. And then, like I said, I just kind of turn these up, pull them off. I'll just lay them upside down here for a second. Turn them up. Hold the paper down if you need to. Turn them up. Wow, that's really super clean on the bottom. See how thick that is. It just gives you an idea. That's what you're looking for. So let's go hang this up and come back and uh, answer any questions you might have. So that's our Hannah meal. We have one Platino and one Hannah meal. I'm probably going to cut a little bit of paper off the bottom of this. I don't know. Because I'll do a, obviously do a square image on this. Set you down over here and I'm going to hang this up over with our other one here. Oh, I got some gelatinized paper here. Hang you up over here. Boom. Boom. I got some weights here. Keep it from curling so much. There we go. Now I can turn the fan on that if I want. I can, you know, I'm not going to because these are just going to hang overnight. Um, there's our Platino. Here's our Hannah Mule we just did. Perfect. Just like that. That's it. Um, I'm not going to do this other sheet. Just let that dry out. It's got an ink spot on it. Put my stuff away here and then I'll go out and we'll sit down. We'll answer any questions you might have. Let me turn on my red so I can get out of here. I'm trying to keep my dark room somewhat tidy, but man, it's difficult. Difficult when you got so much stuff going on. And turn off this uh, light over here on my oil table. I do carbon and oil. Um, not so much carbon anymore. I, I just I love oil. Oil and collodio chloride. That's that's my that's my jam. That's what I love. I love doing those. So I, I've given a few gifts out on oil prints. They're, they're they take a long time, but God, they're just so they're so personalized, right? They're so like. You know, you, you get to, you know, it's just not a print and you're done, even with toning and everything. It's just super personalized. Any questions? That, that is where we're at. Uh, um, let me just do this because I, I spent some time on making this so we knew. So there's our paper. And we did a piece of each. So preparing the paper. So you see here. I soaked it in, in cool or tepid water, warm or cool, it doesn't matter. Um, so your paper won't curl. Um, we prepared our gelatin, we heated it up, um, prepared our pouring area, made sure our table was level and all that good stuff, that kind of thing. Um, and now we went back to the clean level table. We laid our magnetic strips, so this should make more sense to you now, laid our magnetic strips down poured the warm gelatin in the center and then used the comb to move it all. And I say connected. I just moved that gelatin so it just buttered up against those magnetic strips. Waited for a few minutes, used the opposite edge of the razor and cleaned it off. And then next time when we meet, we're going to sensitize the paper and we'll go through all of these and we'll talk about how to process the, the paper and um, ink it up and all that. Let me talk, go back here to exposure here real quick. Um, we, didn't, we didn't get to talk 
too much about um, the exposure. The negative, here we go. Um, this, this is what I, this is, these are my thoughts that I kind of wrote down. Um, so I say here, uh, starting in the um, 1 6 to the 1 8 D max. And my, you know, they, they work very well for the wet collodion negatives. If you have a good dense negative, you're gonna you're starting out with oil prints. You're gonna you're gonna do very well um, with it. Um, if we have a nice day the next time we meet, I'll print it out in the in the shade over here in the window well. We've got north light coming here. I think I printed one out the other day. I think it was 12 or 13 minutes. Uh, and if not, we'll go to the Ryonet and we'll we'll print out so and I can show you what they look like before you clear them, then we'll swell it and we'll go through all that. So that is kind of, that is all that I had, which is quite a bit, right? I mean, that's a lot. To, can, ah. can, can I just step you back to that printing process, if you don't please, mind? Please. You, you said, uh, if I understand, read that correctly when it went up, you print out until you start to see highlights? Yes, until I start to see highlight uh, details in the highlight areas. So, so what, with the with the with the D Max that you're working with, that would suggest you just allow the blacks to block up. Yes, exactly, and, okay. and that's that's what you're doing, right? Exactly right. What you're doing is you're allowing basically that dichromated gelatin to completely harden. You want that to lay flat. Any rays, anything in the shadow areas that you raise up, if it's not true tonal area, you're gonna ink up and it's gonna repel ink, right? And if you think in that degree, if it's just flat hard gelatin, you're gonna soak up all that ink. If it's raised a little bit, you're gonna repel a little bit of it. The more it's raised, the more it's gonna repel. So what you do is you lose contrast if you don't do that. And it's partly the technique in inking up. You're gonna see this. I'm gonna, we're gonna flub up a couple. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you some of the common mistakes that I've found on, on inking. Uh, you can control contrast even with the speed and the pressure you roll it out. You can take your wedge, step wedge and clear the highlight areas. You can add, you can take away, you can take erasers and take, I mean, it's just, it, I, I, like I said, I'm surprised people haven't wanted to do more. I've only done one workshop in this, on this process in my whole, whole time of doing this. And people want to do carbon, they want to do albumin they want to do uh they want to do all kinds of uh other processes but the oil print and i don't know why um but my my two favorite the favorites that i've done i even like look at look at the d max are very similar in these and you can see the but but um i found beginning if you have a good a dense negative and if you don't make one Make one just to try this. Gelatin is inexpensive. Uh, water, yeah, you hate your water up. Uh, potassium dichromate's not that much. Very dangerous. We're going to talk about that on the next session when we go to sensitize the, the uh, paper we just uh, poured, uh, gelatin, gelatinized paper. And again, back to Dale's point, keep this in mind. There is nothing in that gelatin that we just poured on that paper other than 40 gram, 8%. Eight so I made a half a batch. I did 500 mils of distilled water, 40 grams of um, gelatin. And then I added about 10, 12, 15 mils of grain alcohol at the end after it was melted. And that's just because I'm shaking it and mixing it to get those micro bubbles out of there. That alcohol will just break that out. And if you pour your little cup to pour your plate or paper and you have a uh, you have uh, bubbles in there, just take your little spritzer of alcohol. That'll just pop the bubbles right away. And it won't hurt anything. That evaporates out. There's a little bit of distilled water. It doesn't hurt anything. All of that goes away in the end. All of that goes away in the end. It's just the gelatin and the ink that you have on the paper, if that makes sense. Is that good, guys? You tell me. Tell me where we're at. Quinn, how long, how long are you keeping these uh, this this 8% gelatin? And are you using anything to... Uh, to keep any of the nasty stuff out like thymol. Yes, exactly, yes. I have a jar of thymol in there. You know, to be honest, that's a great question, John. I appreciate that. The, um, the thymol, and what he's referring to is, I just made that batch of gelatin yesterday, right? So I have, in this cool weather, I'm gonna say two months to use that up. 500 mils, I'll usually just sit down, 
all make up as much. You'll be surprised how fast it goes, actually. These are, these are small little prints we're doing in this workshop. Um, but if I start doing um, whole plate or larger, you, you'll, you'll drink that stuff up. I recommend, if you can avoid using alum for hardener, if you do 250 bloom, alum is a product you can add to it to stiffen up the gelatin as well when it's um, toughen it up and thiamol to prevent the the mold the the degradation you get you you get stuff growing on it it's animal byproduct right so john's absolutely correct it takes about six months for me to have a jar um, i've left it in there i just let it set it takes about six months in my dark room for it to go bad i've quit adding thiamol i have a whole jar of it in there I like to mix it up and use it. I'll mix the quantity that I want. Usually I'll know because you pour paper, that gelatinized paper, you can put, stack it up, flatten it out and use it over the years. If you, if you can sit down and have the patience to pour it and do all that, use all of that stuff up. But if you don't want to and you want to keep it around, John's absolutely correct. Use a little bit of thiamol in there and that'll, that'll keep the nasty stuff out. Wait, what else did you say here? Let's see, sorry, I haven't been paying attention to the chat. Uh, so what what you just suggested, if I heard this correctly here, Quinn, if I can jump in, is the gelatinized paper has no shelf life? Correct. That is correct. Okay. That, that's like keeping a jar of photo bloom on your shelf. It'll, it'll go forever. It's dry, no problem. Once you introduce um, water and then heat, bacteria, you'll start like John says, you'll start growing. You'll, you'll have a science chemistry class there after a while. But it's not really that bad. It takes quite a while, especially in a cool, dark area where you probably should have all your chemistry anyway. But if you don't, you live in a hot, humid area and you can't put some thiamol in there. That's not a problem. And I'll address that next time. Actually, I'll, uh, I think I did, uh, for a liter, I'll do a gram of alum, uh, alum uh, for hardener, and I do that in carbon prints. I actually use alum in carbon prints more than oil prints, and I, it wasn't much thiamol that I, I used to do that year, a couple, three years ago when I started. I, I put thiamol in it, but I don't anymore, but you can. Uh, what do we have in the chat? John asked again, or John asked, have you tried vellum? I have not tried vellum. I have not tried vellum. That would be interesting to do, though. I'm, you know, you guys should experiment with this because when you after you buy your uh, gelatin um, and i like the photo bloom 250 for the strength and the cleanliness you can use store-bought gelatin just unflavored gelatin try it um you got water ink and gelatin and, a, and some paper play around it's it, you'll be surprised um sean are you still in here buddy no we we haven't missed q a you can come in here i told you we we're going to do one at the end so um, Ugo or isopropyl alcohol for the bubbles and gelatin. Yes, isopropyl alcohol is is fine too. I just don't like adding anything extra into my mixtures. So when you master dichromates, gum bichromate becomes an easy new path. Yeah, yep, yep. Um, any of the any of the pigment prints? Pigment printing is so different from chloride printing, silver chloride printing. Um, the results, you know, the pictorialists used it. Like I said earlier, as I get older, I, I'm g going more into that kind of soft mode and the straight photographs don't do much for me anymore. Maybe I've seen too many of them, but uh, nothing wrong with a beautiful, sharp, gorgeous image. I, that, that's, that's great too. But the, the soft pictorial nature of these are just, and, and, and to be able to do stuff like melt gelatin, you know, melt the image, put it, put it under a press and sh gloss it up. And I mean, there's so many things you can do. Sean, you want to jump in here and show us your problems? Yes, I, I did. Can you hear me? Yeah, do you have a video? Yeah, let me just sort it out. Yeah, sort it out, and I'll put you on the... Uh... Sean wants to talk about his problems. Linda shared some of hers earlier. There you oh, go. There's a weird background on there, but... Hey, don't worry about it. We're going to spotlight you there. Show us what you got going, brother. I think I've got a virtual setting on my background. Can you see this? Uh, yeah, get some transmitted light on it. You get some 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 shine through light. Oh, oh, it's a tintype though. No, it's a clear. No, it's clear. Plate. Okay, yeah. Uh, try to. Try, do you have a background just like a white background you could lay it against? A piece of paper or something. I have a black background. Just a. Um, yeah, maybe that would a white background would be better to be. Okay, there you go. There you go. 
Okay, is that the image that we put up that you sent me? That is just a test plate, so it's meant to be clear. Okay, so tell us, let's recap this, Sean. What you've done in your darkroom, you poured a plate, you sensitized it, yeah. and then did you put, you said you put it in your plate holder for a few seconds or something, and then, yeah, there you go. Hold it up against your, your left side over there, yeah. up against the white. There you go, yeah. Yeah, so, so there's nothing quite, there's just kind of a gob. It looks like a light, partial light leak on one side. So tell us where you're at. Recap. This was, this was a developed plate where it's going to be an image. There you go. Yeah. So yeah. I started making plates in my first session. I'm a bit of a novice. Yeah. And I've been researching for a few months. So I did my first session and, and they all came out cloudy. So therefore, potentially it's a light leak because the whole image was cloudy all the way across. So I did that test plate. Yeah, it. there you go. There you, we can see that now. Okay, so there you go. That tells me now it, it's it, it could be your dark room light that you're using or your dark box light that you're using. Yeah. So you need to so, be able to sort that out and eliminate that first. Right. And then after first you need to before you can even test your chemistry, you need to know that your light sources aren't screwing that stuff up. Yeah. So it's really difficult to do this, but what you need to do is you need to actually pull your plate in the dark and run developer over it and count off 15 seconds, turn your light on, turn your water on, arrest that development, and then fix it out through. Because if you can't right. do that, you're, you won't know where your light's at. Yeah, because I'm using a head torch at the moment with three layers of ruby lift. And I thought that might be enough, but I don't know if the LEDs shining through is still too bright. That might be fogging. It could be. It could, yeah, that ruby lift. Here's the thing with ruby lift. I put that on the back. I had a van in the, uh, from a 1996 Dodge van. And on the back of it, I put root, two sheets of ruby lith over it. And I pull it up like that. And I'd have the, the dark cloth hanging down. And where that light came through the ruby lith would fog every single plate I had. So depending on the strength of the UV and the strength of the ruby lith. And they don't make it necessarily for these processes, right? So yeah. um, you have to kind of test that. If you can do... Another thing you can do, which I don't really recommend, but if you could get a low, low, low watt torch or flashlight that you could put in the corner to just barely see, just so you, just so you can process and know that your chemistry is okay. Then after, if your chemistry is okay, then you know your light source is going to be the next issue you tackle. Then the next source will be your dark box or your plate holder. Could even the smallest pinhole of light cause that much fogging, or is that something excessive? No, that's some that's something glaring. If that if that dark strip, if I if what I'm seeing right now is a flare, that looks like a band of light or yeah. a strip of chemistry, and I don't think it's your chemistry because it's too it's almost too even. Yeah, because the only only strong light coming through is my head torch so that's what that's my number yeah. one uh john says sean do you have anything with native red leds um meaning that, that avoid the ruby lift do you have anything native with red led no but i can probably buy something with it yeah um i don't know what they have i can't remember the big box stores in the uk but here in america at like a home depot or a lowe's store they have the little curly red lights yeah. And and they also have the red torch head bicycle torch headlamps that are actually red. Those are both good. Um, yeah, I'll have a look online because all the shops in over here at the moment are shut. Well, that, the there you go. Yeah, yeah. Welcome to welcome to coronavirus land, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah thanks. So I'll try. I'll try it at the weekend with the developer and without taking out the dark box. Do that. Do that and check back yeah. with us because we'll we'll get you sorted out. We this is not. This is a process like Linda came on a little while ago and she, she showed us what she did and her process. And we were talking about very fresh collodion with an old silver bath or a collodion that hasn't had a time to ripen. Um, and what I talked about is the colors here of your collodion and what color you want it. Color is important in collodion, guys. It just it really is important because that gives you both your exposure and your tonal range of proper values. I'm not saying you can't use light green collodion. I mean, you can, but you're going to have to, have to adjust accordingly. So you wouldn't say that's a silver bath issue because I've had some people say there might be a problem with the silver bath or it's overdeveloped. It's, yeah, it, it could be a, a overdevelopment for sure. A silver bath problem would be more universal 
meaning, um, you know, if you had a pH problem, you wouldn't have that kind of contrast, even the contrast that you have in it. My biggest concern is um, your your other chemistry coming through. And, and you will know the minute you run a plate, a clear glass plate without any problematic head light or, or potential light sources that could be problematic, you'll know if it's your chemistry or not. And that'll be your silver, your develop everything. Just stay at that 15 seconds, no matter, yeah. you, you, you're not exposing it anyway, so it doesn't really matter what you're trying to do. And even if it's a little mucky on the edges and the technique's a little poor, it doesn't matter. What you want is the majority of that glass to be very somewhat clear, at least somewhat clear. Not like yeah. that. That there's something chemical or light hitting that plate during this process. So check that out and then come back we'll to it. Exactly. We're gonna be we're gonna we'll be do. back here Thanks Saturday. For we'll be back Saturday uh, for uh for a for uh, uh Queen. Oil print. Yes. Uh Jan here. Yes, Jan. Uh I think about uh, salt print, and uh, if you have a, a little dense uh, negative, and you got uh, a little soft or dull uh, print out, yeah, uh, can you then take more uh, silver, stronger silver? Um, what you want to do on a salt print. It is same with albumin. You'll want to match your salt content in your sizing solution with the type of, of uh, the amount of silver you're using in your sensitization bath. So in other words, if you're using 15 grams of ammonium chloride in your salt bath, use a 15% silver to sensitize that paper. The other thing you can do if you're getting very flat salt prints, is you might want to consider adding a little bit of dichromate to okay. the sizing solution. Um, that's that's okay. another way to control contrast. Uh, you oh, yeah, you there you go. Yep. Uh, it's a difficult lot here. Uh, hey, but uh, that printed well, it looks like. Yeah, uh, this is, uh, I think it was, it's okay. Yeah, that printed well, Jan. You, it doesn't look like it's toned though. It's just fixed. Uh, it's very sharp and uh, everything. You, you see at the uh, Facebook, I took earlier this week, but sometimes I feel it's a little too soft. I like soft dreaming yellow pictures, yellow brown, but yeah. uh, sometimes I want some more contrast yeah. to, uh, to get the details. You, you know what you'd love, Jan? is you'd either love an albumin print or a collodial chloride print. Both of those, see salt, pot, salt prints tend to go down into the paper a little bit, mm -hmm. right? Your, yeah. Even your sizing and your silver, it tends to, to go down in a little bit and soften things up a little bit. That's why you like to wax them, right? Uh, this will look like floating out in the paper. Yes, exactly. It does. Not be so sharp. Yeah, so if you take the albumin and you take the egg white or you take the collodion chloride and you take the collodion, those two binders, come up off the paper, raise it up off the paper, sharp, sharp. Yeah, yeah. Can I jump in, Quinn? Please. Yeah, Jan, I'm just curious, how do you, when you're printing out your salt prints, are you printing them in direct sunlight or overcast light? I, I, uh, I use a softbox with uh, four uh, CFL uh, bulbs. I understand. They each uh, 105 watt. It's uh, around uh, four, it's uh, four, 500 watt uh, if you change it to normal. That's I quite a wide around... exposure. Yeah, I think, I think, Jan, if you take your salt print in the frame, just as you would normally do in front of your lights, uh, take them outside and print them in, um, in open shade or open shadow, that will, it will probably take a little bit less time to print than you're used to, and it will also increase the contrast that you're looking for. Definitely. Yeah, I, I use uh, around eight minutes. That's my, uh, and eight minutes is okay for me. And I have uh, a spotlight, uh, UV spot. Sometimes I use that, and that uh, uh, pop, pop up. But uh, here in Norway, no, yeah. I live here. Is the snow windy, raining every day? <laughs> yeah. I don't. Uh, well, I'm in, I'm in Canada, so I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot I go out. There is no light. 
<laughs> but when, well, when, when you're actually, some light, I get wet all over. <laughs> um, actually, you can uh, you can nice thing about printing out the the printing out process is you can stick that print the printing frame outside in the middle of winter and it will still print for you. In fact, in winter time, if you have lots of snow down, that sun reflecting off the snow will increase your ultraviolet light. So uh, I, th I think if you tried that, you might be surprised. Anyway, I'll, okay. I'll back off now, Quinn. I will, I will try that. So because some of the picture I want soft, it's, the, it's about the mood in some, mm -hmm. some of the pictures. Or the picture I want sharp. So this, that's yeah. the difference. Uh, I, yeah, shade. Oh, sharp. So I'm sorry. Out, I, printing, I out thought you table, printing out in the Thank shade will definitely much. increase your contrast, though, Gian, is what Dale's saying. Printing out in the shade, um, adding a little dichromate to your sizing solution, um, that, that will all increase contrast. You, you know, but again, uh, you know, uh, people can testify to this that do a lot of salt prints here. Uh, salt prints are going to be uh, uh, softer. They're just going to be softer because of the, the paper you're using. Thank you, good stuff. both of you. Yeah, Thank good you. stuff. No, thanks for sharing. All right, guys, it's 1216. Let's call that a wrap. And uh, I'll upload this video um, to YouTube. Um, it'll, take, it'll take a few hours, but I'll get this up. That way you can refer back to it uh, for some notes. And um, next time we meet, what we're going to do, if you want to, well, I'm going to do, if you want to join us, you can, is I'm going to um, sensitize. Uh, we're going to talk about dichromates and sensitizing those gelatinized papers that we poured today. I've got two of them, a Hanamule and a Platino. We're going to go in the dark room. We're going to sensitize those, hang them up to dry, have a little Q&A while those are drying, put some negatives down, print some out, clear the prints, and and go for the next session. The next session will swell those. This is the third video. We'll swell those prints that we exposed and cleared, and we will start inking those up on the third video. So you'll be able to see the whole process of oil printing, and you will absolutely fall in love with it. Thanks, guys. Everybody, thank you so much. I appreciate everyone jumping in. And, uh, and uh, yeah, Peter, good to see you, brother. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate the support. Hang in there. Don't let, any, don't let anybody rent space in your head about all these terrible things happening in the world. Let's stay safe. And join me Saturday, and we'll print out some oil prints and get them ready for inking up. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your day, wonderful rest of your week. We'll see you next time. Ciao.